Today's episode of In the Trenches is brought to you by System 12 Guitar Method. Sign up today at RyanRoxy.com. In the Trenches with Ryan Roxy. Hello, 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 and welcome to another live stream episode of In the Trenches. I am your host, Ryan Roxy. And uh, yeah, if it looks like I'm in a different location like I have been these last few weeks, you are right. I'm in a much more family-oriented uh, location. I'm at my father's wife's house um, here in Florida, sunny Florida. I got some sun. I am not at the North Pole. We'll be heading back to the North Pole in Sweden and Stockholm uh, for next week's episode. But we have just wrapped up an Alice Cooper tour, and it uh, culminated on the Monsters of Rock cruise, which for all of you that were out on that cruise, thank you much for uh, showing up, and uh, hopefully you're safe and healthy, and we will get back to you in about a month as we embark on another tour with Buck Cherry and Alice Cooper heading back to the States. But uh, that's enough of my business with uh, the rock and roll end of it and touring part. It's time for In the Trenches. And uh, it's great to have one of those iconic ones from time to time that might not actually make the music, but their input and promoting and writing about it is vital to the artists and, and to the entire experience, musical experience. Our guest today has been uh, chronicling rock and roll for decades and brought us some of the most entertaining and juicy rock bios ever to be published. Some which has actually landed the author himself in some hot water, as well as immortalized himself in uh, certain bands' song lyrics. Here to talk about some of those incredible an uh, anecdotes I always say antidotes, uh, anecdotes, plus his newest projects. Welcome into the trenches, the world's leading rock and metal writer, Mick Wall. Hello, Mick. Ryan Roxy, it's an absolute delight to be here. I, 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 before we begin, I've got to tell you very, very quickly, because Alice is a very special artist to me. Um, he was my gateway into rock and roll, really. School's Out uh, was a number one single in this country. I just turned 40, and I'd never seen anybody like Alice Cooper on TV doing that. And about a month later, uh, a, a friend of mine and I, we went to the youth club disco. I don't know what the equivalent would be in the USA, but like a Friday night club, you know, uh, uh, sodas and music and girls, you know. And, uh, and we, both, we both drew on Alice Cooper makeup with felt black felt pen and of course I had a lot, lot of long hair in those days and man I gotta tell you the girls were like zoom. we were surrounded by girls all night easily the most popular boys in the room and then it came to like 10 p.m and you gotta go home and and we suddenly realized that all the other guys in the room hated us and wanted to kick <laughs> our ass and as we left this club in our Alice Cooper makeup, we had to run, man, so fast, so fast. And then going home and trying to scrub this stuff off. I mean, it was, uh, I've just never forgotten it. I nearly got killed that night, but I was never more attractive to, to a girl or a woman in my whole life as I was that night. So I just thought I would let you know that one. <laughs> Well, thank you. That That's perfect, because that's actually how we like to kick off uh, the podcast, is we always like to go back to get forward. So without further ado, Vic, let's go back to get forward. I mean... That's a perfect way to start off the podcast because you have this immediate association um, with Alice. And for me, um, being so influenced by bands that came from the UK, late 70s bands, and that's sort of like exactly where, uh, you know, you started your career, it seems like in, in that sort of era. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some years before because Growing up in the UK during the 60s and 70s had to expose you to some of those great bands that I'm talking about and that I was inspired as well from. Um, but what inspired you to become a writer? Was there, was there a musician lurking inside your body or was writing always your calling? I, um, 
uh, I wanted to learn to play the guitar and I just couldn't. I just, I, I have very small hands and I just could not get with it. Um, but I'd always written. I just had a, had a, I just like, I mean, I, I tried to write my first song and I remember it very clearly. I must have been about eight years old and I sat down with a pen and I remember writing, hey, baby and that's as far as i got i couldn't think of anything to come up with after that but as the years went by i i just i was it was the one thing i was good at was writing at school and so by the time i'm buying uh what we used to call lps albums uh in the in the early 70s i'm now writing lyrics so um mm. i was going to be a singer it was as simple as that and and I had quite a gravelly voice, so I would sing Elected, School's Out, No More Mr. Nice Guy, because that was where I came in with Alice, was School's Out, Billion Dollar Babies. Um, but also Rod Stewart. And, 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 and really, that was an amazing time. I, of course, you don't realise at that moment that you're in a particular time. But, you know, Led Zeppelin... Um, uh, but for me, it wasn't like, oh, here is rock and here is pop. It was Elton John, David Bowie, uh, uh, progressive, got Pink Floyd. Um, it was that whole scene. And, and, and through that, you discover Bob Dylan and Jimi Hendrix. And um, it was just, there seemed to be an incredible album released almost every week. Um, yeah. and, so, and so in my head, I was going to be a singer. I was going to be a rock and roll star. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I left school at 16 um, without any thought of an education because I'm going to be a rock and roll singer. So uh, I've already begun my education with all my records, you know. <laughs> um, but I tell you what happened was um, when I was 18, I got my first review published in a music magazine in the UK. And they immediately sent me to these tiny pubs and clubs. It was the punk era had just come to like 76. And um, I, bands that would never become famous would really weren't very good. But there I was on pub or club watching these guys unload the gear, load the gear, play to 50 people, if that. It just seemed horrible. Um, and I remember thinking, nah, it's just too much like hard work. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll stick to this writing stuff. You know, I seem to be getting somewhere with that. I, I did make an album, but that wasn't until much later. And that, that uh -huh. is a whole story. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we're going to talk about that album, but I want to focus on those early, because you began your career right around my sort of – I. I I signed my my uh, signature Roxy 77. The 77 uh -huh. is for 1977 because if you look at so many artists, they either made the bet their best debut album or they came out with their with their debut album or made perhaps one of the best albums of that band or artist career. And that was 77. And that's when you started um, contributing to the, you know, weekly sounds, or maybe it was a little bit before it was around that time. So you were experienced and you were um, sort of reporting back to us about punk, new wave, rock, new romantic, you know, in what would oh, eventually wow. become heavy metal. So as you can see, yeah. This is all your work from I guess I should should have been the year seventy seven. Am I correct? No, seventy seven is absolutely spot on. Yeah, um, I, uh, I I I I didn't go in there at like oh I'm in you know I'm strictly punk new wave nothing else. I you know I was listening. I lived in a I li I left home at seventeen. I lived in a house full of hippies. And I was listening to J.J. Kale and Ravi Shankar and, 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 and all kinds of crazy stuff that you didn't read about, read about in the music papers. But I still loved, you know, David Bowie and, and Roxy Music and all these people. And the first punk record I ever heard was uh, Anarchy in the UK by the Sex Pistols. And it just blew my mind. 
but I didn't think of it as different. I, I, to me, it was like uh, Jonathan Richman and the Modern Lovers. It was like the Ramones. And the, and the two artists that really sealed the deal for me were television, Marky Moon, uh, and Patti Smith, Horses. Um, uh, and that, to me, was, was a, a real leap forward in terms of where rock music was going to go. But the whole punk thing, which kind of came along around that time, just after, to me, it was very divisive. I, I, I wrote about it because it was my only way to get through the door. And punk had completely taken over the music scene. So those were the bands I was sent to review. But in amongst there, I also would write about people like Elvis Costello before he got famous. Or uh, I remember there was a great group called Clover who just, they were like a country rock band, but with edge. And they were fantastic. But they wasn't, that little... with, wasn't that with Huey Lewis was in the, in the band Clover? Absolutely spot on. So, so what happened was Clover suddenly couldn't get arrested in London because suddenly it's all punk all the time. And they went back to America and then cut to three, four years later and we've got Huey Lewis in the news, yeah. which really came out of Clover. You know, I mean, Huey was uh, one of two singers, I think, in Clover, but fantastic front man, you know. I think that I, I remember actually having uh, the pleasure of meeting Huey Lewis and we, we talked for a bit and it was one of those odd conversations where he talks about how Phil and not from thin Lizzy took them on tour and would be like, basically thin Lizzy were Clover's biggest fans and helped them much of the way. I'm sure you were probably reviewing thin Lizzy back in those days and probably uh, were working with them as well because you know, at that point, you had started your own heavy publicity agency, your PR firm. So was that one of the bands that you worked with then Lizzie, yeah. Ultravox? Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, the the agency existed already, and I, I went there as a, as a hire. Um, but things moved so fast in those days, and within about seven or eight months, um, one of the main partners left uh, her husband was ed bicknell and his group dire straits had just exploded he managed <laughs> them he managed them so she left she didn't need to work anymore um and then the, one of the other partners uh one of his groups took off they were called the motors and they were really big in england had a couple of giant hits so suddenly there was one partner left and he was the youngest guy and he just said to me okay Let's do this. So we did. And so by the time I was 21, I was a partner in this PR firm called Heavy Publicity. And we worked with Tim Lizzie, Black Sabbath, Journey, The Damned, Dire Straits, REO Speedwagon. I love Stim the spectrum, the sp like a huge spectrum of rock, you know? It, it, well, it was mainly rock, but because punk was so such a thing, like we did Hawkwind, uh, and their manager then became Motorhead's manager. And out of Motorhead came Girls' School, and uh, and then <laughs> started managing The Damned. And so it was just, you know, we just found ourselves in there. And, and you were right uh, in the thick of it. I love that you were right in the thick of it, because <laughs> th th does your... I, I mean, with working with all these different genres of rock and roll music, because whether it's punk rock, new wave, heavy metal, uh, straight ahead up, you know, classic rock, is there a place in your heart for any of it, for for one style of music, or do you enjoy it all? I think um, I really do enjoy it all. Um, but you know, a group like Thin Lizzy always very close to my heart because. I do like rock music, um, but I like, like, I'm not blowing smoke here, but seriously, the kind Alice made, the kind the Scones made, um, uh, and then later you see people like Springsteen or whoever, but uh, Thin Lizzy were a fantastic band, but they wrote fantastic songs. It was like if Van Morrison had started a hard rock band, you know, um, <laughs> And, of course, they were Irish, and my family, uh, I, I'm Irish. My father was Irish. My mother was Irish. 
Um, so there was a, a connection and it was a weird moment because uh, I discovered in the music business that I very rarely worked with people that I had been a fan of, you know. It did happen sometimes, but it wasn't like it was rare. And uh, But Lizzie were the first band I ever uh, worked with and got to know that I actually, just like, you know, three or four years before, I'd put pictures of them on my bedroom wall, you know. Or I right. still played the records and um, I had to hide it when I was with them. But I, I loved that. <laughs> you know, I, I loved that band. Um, uh, but I, I do think that the, the trouble is when you work in that end of it, particularly publicity and promotion, or if you're writing about it, um, uh, you get overwhelmed with, in those days, in the days of albums, you get overwhelmed with records and concerts and it kind of sullies you a little bit. Um, uh, there are always exceptions, but when it's your day job, when it's your day and night job, when it's your seven day a week job, um, it, it, you find yourself listening to stuff that you wouldn't have gone into a store and bought. You find yourself at concerts by people you, you wouldn't have bought a ticket to see necessarily. No. But of course, it improves your outlook. You learn so much. Um, and then you do get to meet and work with people that uh, you genuinely admire. And and uh, uh, and that can be a double-edged sword. You know, that's, uh, we, you know, that's saying, uh, don't meet your heroes. I don't necessarily agree with that. I've, I've had great times meeting uh, many artists, but yeah, it's it, it ain't it ain't what it says in the brochure, you know. <laughs> I sit back on that tour bus, uh, uh, Ryan. You know this um, perception it, versus reality. There you go. Or you do a terrible gig, the worst gig you've ever done, and you're all yelling at each other. And then finally, they open the door and people come in, and they're all going. That was amazing. I've never seen you so good. And you just, you just, you just want to kill yourself. You know, like these people know nothing well, except it's their big night out. And for them, you were amazing. It's, it's perception. We, we had that experience three days ago, to be honest with you, on our, on the, on the boat cruise. We, we literally, the first song of the set, the curtain goes up and we're like, it sounds great. Why aren't people into it? Then halfway in through the second chorus, they're like, we can't hear you. So when the, when the curtain was going up, it ripped out the uh, main cable to the PA system. Oh, so wow. there was no PA on, but all our in-ears were working. So we had to work really hard to get the audience back. Luckily, we had an amazing crew and, and, and the staff over at the theater in the, on the boat found an extra cable put it back we continued the show but it was work and afterwards we were like man that was a tough show but then all throughout the night we were you know walk on the boat and people were coming up saying that was one of the best shows we've ever seen alice play you know stuff <laughs> goes wrong and you were over you overcame it so i know exactly what you're talking about that you know the perception, what happens versus reality for people. But, um, you know, I, I, I'm impressed most, Mick, and this is like uh, the main question that I, I think I wanted to get out of this entire experience meeting you, not just all your experience of now, what you're doing today with podcasts and how you've been able to um, complement all your writing and all your journalism and now moving it into the podcast world. Um, it's how do you get these artists that you've written so much about to trust you well, because they and, trust you with such personal details and you do the work, you do the homework, you do the research, but th there's got to be an element of trust between these artists and you, right? Absolutely. And it is a thing that, that you work at and spend years and years building without necessarily knowing exactly what you're doing. I was lucky, you know, the era when I first became a music journalist, particularly in the UK, because unlike the United States, you know, we only had like three TV channels, one national music radio station that would play pop music or rock music. So the weekly music papers were like the social media of the age. They were like the TikTok of the 70s or 80s. <laughs> they, were, right. they, they were the arbiters of good taste. They were the gateway, particularly for album-oriented acts. 
So if you weren't, if you didn't have a hot single on the charts, you, you, you weren't seen on television, you weren't on radio, maybe late at night, but it was not a happening thing. So the music papers were really important. They could make or break an artist. And the record companies had money. And, and, and we would go on the road with bands for two weeks at a time, three weeks. But because we were weekly music papers, two months later, we're back again. Um, uh, and, and that went on for a really long time. I mean, I remember, uh, and, and the tours would get longer, of course. It used to be six months, and it was a year, two years. I remember when Def Leppard released their Hysteria album in 1987. Um, their world tour lasted for about 13 months, which by today's standards is, 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 not, is not exceptional. But back then was long. Right. And I turned up in five different countries interviewing them, writing about them. I had a weekly TV show. They came on it like three different times in that year. And we're all around the same age. I'm actually a year or two older. And uh, we just got to know each other. And 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 what they knew, I, I didn't, see, I'd been, a, I'd, a heavy publicity, I'd been the guy bringing the journalists to the show. And I had seen that as soon as you bring these guys into the dressing room, everything changes everybody's trying to accommodate this intrusion knowing they're gonna to have to read about it you know and then as soon as they were gone people would go oh, now i can be myself <laughs> god go back to you know trying to kill the bass player or something but um <laughs> i didn't want to be that guy so by the time i uh, uh my career started really taken off as a writer i'd been a publicist i'd worked at a record company and i knew the things that they dreaded and i made sure i never put them in the story um and in the 80s that meant no mention of drugs no mention of groupies um so my articles have a lot of words like drinking or partying but uh, i never ever ever let the side down you know you knew you were in safe hands yeah. um, uh, and, and because there would be such a continuous relationship, I had I did a radio show. I was starting to write books. You built up a complete trust with the artist and the audience. I love it. Uh, I, I I do have a question for you. <laughs> Vic, Vic Shalfon, our producer, will from time to time put pictures up that will inspire and perhaps bring back some good memories. So if any of these photos come up and pop up and you have a nice uh, story about that, then there you go. But, you know, okay. yeah. as we all know, hey, rock and roll and hair and all that kind of stuff is part of it. But, you know, <laughs> over the years, you start wearing beanies a little bit and sometimes you just don't wear a beanie. <laughs> hang on man hang uh, on uh, oh yeah oh yeah okay now now we're kicking ass there we go i love it <laughs> the reason i've got, got this on is because it's quite warm in my little study here to, uh, tonight because the storm i've got all the heat on but um uh, yeah, it, it's funny i go to these award ceremonies sometimes and you look around and there's all these rock stars and i'm including alice here um, but of that vintage, they're all in their 70s, and they've got the blackest hair. You know, they've got the, <laughs> they've got the best, the blackest. No one's got a grey hair, you know. Um, I love that. It's really funny. Well, I, I I know when we're about ready to begin a tour run, I will come in and uh, Alice will come into the first sound check because that's the only sound check he comes in for the whole tour is the you know the first one. But his hair will be nice, coiffed, dyed, perfect, and it's actually you could tell it's somebody blow blow dry it. Right. But you know what? To this day, Alice Cooper, one of the best hairlines in rock and roll. I mean, I got the landing strips. That's why I'm, I'm usually wearing a hat and stuff like that. I got I got a couple of little landing strips that get that keep going back every single year, and 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 that's okay. I'm good with it because you know what? I've decided that uh, hats and caps can be your your sort of aesthetic. Hats, caps, and a and a wristband are kind of like my identity uh, aesthetically now. It's funny that everybody has you know we're, we're we're cartoon characters at the end of the day, and if you can establish a cartoon character type of image whether it's Slash and his top hat or Alice yeah. and his eyes or, yeah. of course, Kiss and their makeup, 
then you've actually got, you know, you've gone on to, or, or Angus Young and his school, schoolboy outfit at 70 something years old. I know. He's, that, that's getting a little weird. Let's be honest. That is <laughs> just a little weird, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's funny well yeah. you know what i i mean like i said you being able to get this trust with mm -hmm. the artist and i think it has a lot to do with integrity now here's a question i've always wanted to ask uh, from that era of music because we've all heard about as musicians radio stations back in the day record companies would give them a little payola a little sniffy sniffy, if you will, a little Absolutely. son of money. Yeah. As a, as a journalist and, and as, as someone that was, you know, has been paid his entire life to review and to speak the truth, have record companies, you know, do you know if, that if payola in the journalistic world is a real thing and have you ever been offered a little bit of, you know, well, um, uh, yes, but by the time I came along, it was a little more sophisticated. Mm. And and because, uh, you know, there were four major weekly music papers in the UK and they all had their own writers and photographers. So that was quite a, an area to cover. But radio, there were maybe two or three shows in the whole country that would play the album stuff. And the record companies... They went to town with those guys. I mean, they would, you know, I mean, I mean, escorts, drugs. Um, they wouldn't necessarily, they wouldn't come out and say, here's $500 or something. They would just fly them first class to Vegas for five nights, fully paid. Uh, yeah. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. And then, <laughs> Uh, uh, you know, a month later, come bounding in with some record and they'd, they'd feel obliged to play it. I tell you what, though, when I was um, at Heavy Publicity, uh, we had our own form of payola. And it wasn't, it uh, actually did kind of get to that stage sometimes, but it didn't come from a place originally of we'll do this and then they will do what we want them to do. But it definitely worked that way. And that was uh, cocaine. Um, we yeah. because we have to remember the late 70s, uh, we didn't call it drugs, cocaine was like vintage champagne. You know, you'd say, Oh, I've got a, <laughs> I've got a particularly good batch that it came from the side of the mountain in Bolivia. There you go, um, Peruvian uh, flake. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's like I had it, I had it jetted in. No, you didn't, you bought it off the same dealer, everybody got it from. But um, if you came to our office, we would be like, would you like a drink? Would you like a brandy? Uh, we'd have a box of cigarettes. You know, have one of those. Roll a joint and let's do some of this. And it wasn't like, oh, wow, what are we doing? It was uh, – if we turned up at meetings without this, it was considered very poor form. What's up with those guys? They used to be fun. And it got to the point, Ryan, where uh, we did – Lizzie, Sabbath, and on the invoices that we would send to their management every month, we'd itemize the expenses, whatever. And then there'd be one thing called champagne and flowers for the band. <laughs> I, okay. All I, can, all I can tell you is we never bought any champagne or flowers for any band. <laughs> that was always the most expensive item on the invoice. And everybody was happy to pay it because they knew it kept the party going and no. and we did we got tons of press for artists just based on the fact that people like being around you know Sh champagne um, and flowers is more like jack daniels and plants because I, I guess cocaine would be plant-based at that point very green these days plant-based wow yeah, yeah yeah so champagne and flowers folks if you ever see that on an invoice uh, <laughs> that you get sent we know what you're up to. I love it still. But then again, hey, we're talking 1977, late 70s, early 80s, and we are talking all the things that sort of were the zeitgeist of yeah. that era, right? Yeah. It, it wasn't like something, and I think even it does seem like a, a we, because we survived, right? Because yeah. we're both sitting here in, you know, with in these relatively, you know, nice surroundings um 
it's it's it we can look back with a little bit of nostalgia but obviously there were dark times there were definitely people that unfortunately did not make it to the point where you actually even a couple years later started a podcast called dead rock stars <laughs> and i would and i would say that that a, a few of those rock stars might have been hit by the old champagne and flowers uh <laughs> repercussions <laughs> look, look, listen 100 um i mean we mentioned thin lizzy phil liner uh died a terrible death um triggered by a massive heroin overdose and it really was a dark story which you know maybe we'll tell another time but he was 36 36 i mean that's I nothing know. and we know of the ones that died at 27 but, uh, you know, there are certain things worse than death. Uh, and I, and I, the, what I'm thinking of here are those that didn't die but didn't survive, whose careers went down the toilet, whose, uh, um, whose lives never recovered. Um, and bad now they... Choices. Very bad choices. A lot of sad stories. Um but thank God, I think, you know, if there hadn't been those times, they were all part of a, a bigger consciousness raising, if you like. Like I say, we didn't call them drugs. It was, uh, you know, get you in the mood to do the right thing, you know, and it was all partying. very cool. Partying, but also creative, you know, uh, feeling you were all creative and, and doing stuff. Um and if it hadn't been for that, we wouldn't be in this, I believe, much more enlightened happening time where, um, you know, uh, cannabis is now legal in, I think, most states in America. Um, but it, there's medicinal can cannabis. It's a fantastic plant. And, and, you know, they're now talking about certain microdosing with psilocybin for people with depression. You know, this is this. I, I don't think we would have got to this stage as quickly as we have, even though it feels slow. If it hadn't been for that moment in the 60s, 70s, where rock musicians and it was rock musicians, no one else, everyone followed. But it was the Beatles and Dylan and the Stones and Hendrix and everybody that made it clear that, you know, turn on, tune in, drop out. Uh, Album music itself kind of came from the idea that we want more than a, a little single going, I love you, you love me, oh, how happy we will be. We want albums. You know, how right. do you make albums? If you can find any masterpiece albums in your collection that didn't have anybody on drugs on them, I'd be amazed. <laughs> how, how do you listen to great albums? If you can right. open up your mind as far as possible, and drink ain't going to do it. Maybe a glass or two, you know, lift you. But then it's downhill from there. Whereas the other stuff is like, Psh. did you, I remember listening to this guy brought around some mescaline. And uh, he, he, I'd never heard Weather Report before. And he put Weather Report on and John Coltrane. I got to tell you, man, that, that was the greatest music listening experience of my life. Yeah. I felt I was in the middle of it. I felt it like... It was the universe, you know, and it was. Right. Um, Let me so, ask you this. Is yeah, it, was sorry. there was there ever a point that you yourself had to either hit a wall or saw the abyss and took a step back and said, you know what? Maybe this is going a little bit too far. Oh, no. I, I jumped straight over the cliff and into the abyss. You know, I, <laughs> I did like a swallow dive into it because <laughs> I'm here. I am. Get ready. Don't forget me. Um, no, I did. Unfortunately, by the time I left heavy publicity, um, heroin had become a fact of life, Ooh. and it's such a cliche. You know, uh, it's a I fact. I can handle it. No, you can't. No one can. No. Um, and that took away. That took away about three years of my life. I still um, was able to work for a lot of it. And then right towards the end, I couldn't work because people didn't want to hire me anymore. In fact, I got fired from uh, Virgin Records um, when the whole kind of disaster became apparent. Because it always does. You think you've got the world fooled and the world is looking at you going, that yeah. guy is messed up. Um, but uh, I came out of it. I was 24, 
and uh, wow. didn't, didn't go back. Um, didn't go back because I think heroin. I, there are so many new drugs in these days. I don't, I'm not. Uh, I don't know. Um, but that was uh, it just it's one bad, evil, very bad karmic on every single level. There's not one apart from maybe the first before you become addicted. You know, the first it feels it feels incredible, but maybe it knocks you out. So it's not even that creative, you know. But it definitely that, seems like something you're chasing that first time forever and ever. And I've been I've been lucky enough to be to avoid of all the different little freeways and detours and off ramps that I've sort of gone on with my history. And I'm pretty forthcoming about all that stuff. That's one of, that's the one off ramp I never uh, experienced, not knowingly, not on purpose, but and I'm, and I'm happy to say that, you know, Hey, you know, that's something that uh, that is not a part of my life and hasn't been because I've seen, you know, I've heard that I've heard the tales I've lost. I've lost friends that have been down that road as well. So, I mean, the fact that you're able to rebound at 24, you still have many, many years of creativity, many, many years of, of, of stuff going on because this is, I'm, I'm imagining this is by um, the early eighties wow. And is, uh, I can tell you exactly where that is. That's that's the summer of 1984. And is this Kerrang is, magazine era? Is this during the Kerrang mag? Right. That guy on the left in the dark glasses, that's Ray Palmer. He used to uh, a photographer. He used to specialize in uh, uh, photographing rock chicks. We used to have a page in the magazine called Lady Killers, and it would be readers. <laughs> that um, uh, women that would dress up, you know, in leather and hair and flesh and makeup. And Ray used to shoot them. Uh, he was a real ladies' man. He's gone now, but he was a real ladies' man. The other guy was a photographer as well, um, but not in any sense a wild man. Uh, and then me in the middle. So what that was, Kerrang! magazine was in Covent Garden, a beautiful part of London, and no mobile phones in 1984. So we were one story up above a tube station. But on our side of the building, when you looked out the window, you looked down and literally across the street was a pub. And that was me and those two guys sitting outside that pub. Because what we would do if, if we had a moment, you know, we'd go, right, we're, we're, we're going to the pub. We'll stand outside. If anybody rings or something happens, you need us. You just hold the window up and yell. <laughs> um so that's what we were doing a lot of day drinking in those days um well i have to thank you with kerrang magazine and your contribution with kerrang because that was our lifeline to so many bands that we would we hear about because this was before the internet this was before every single band had an instagram page or a uh, a uh, we official website so if i wanted to know about you know at that time perhaps uh early Motley Crue or, or Hanoi rocks, for instance, yeah. one of my favorite bands out of Finland and who are these guys and, and how, how can they look so friggin' cool on album covers? Cause everybody, I don't care if it was, you know, my band or if it was guns and roses or if it was LA guns, we all looked at those album covers coming out of the UK and coming out of Europe, especially Hanoi rocks. I'll be honest with you. And we said, Image wise, we know they're trying. We know they're taking from the stones. We know that there's definitely a yeah. passing of the torch, but we need to be that. We need to look like that. And I got to tell you, Kerrang! Magazine was instrumental in showing us that because it was before we could just type a certain name and go on the internet. No, I, I, absolutely. So it, thank that's you. why I say it was like the social media of the age because also there hadn't been a dedicated a magazine dedicated to rock and metal. Um, uh, and in the UK, there hadn't been a colour magazine before. And it came out of sounds. Um, uh, because sounds covered all kinds of music, tended to do Queen, ACDC, Thin Lizzy, whatever. Then a lot of the other guys would be doing punk, Two people would do reggae. But when you rang, you'd go through to an old-fashioned switchboard and they'd put the calls through to the office. And it might be any phone that the call came through on. And as a gag, and then it turned into a habit, if you got through to me and the rock guys, we'd, uh, or, or, we'd answer the phone like, da or 
<laughs> Kerrang! Or, but you know, or if you rang the punk guys, they'd be, oi, 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 you know, it just it was a joke. And so when we did this one-off pullout, color, that was the that was the thing, color. That was the catch. Um, yeah. What do we call it? Ha ha ha! Why don't we ha ha ha? Kerrang! <laughs> I'll call it yeah. that. It's a stupid name. It'll be funny. It's a one-off. It'll people will forget about it the next week. So that's what we did. And of course, that became the magazine. And listen, you're right. I mean, I I, I started 18, 19. And by the time I started writing for Krang, I was 25. And I'd been through a lot of that stuff we mentioned. And I, um, uh, I, I just laughed. I would get the new issue and read it and laugh. It was funny as well. And, and Hanoi Rocks, you know, they would come around the office. And I've got to tell you, Michael Munro... It, it would take your breath away when he walked in um, <laughs> the office. I, I don't mean uh, in in a in a gay way. I, or, I mean gay as well, of course. Just but just a beautiful way. He's a beautiful man. Stunning. I mean, it was yeah. like Marilyn Monroe had just walked in the room, or Sophia <laughs> and Ren. You just sort of went, "Oh my god!" You know. Mm. Um, but bands did come round. I mean, you know, we had Man of War come round in in their bare skin you know uh <laughs> we had metallica coming around and we thought they were just awful you know drunken idiots <laughs> so much way. so that you ended up writing their autobiography later yeah. and, well, well, and, yeah, and, I mean, and being honest not. about it to the point <laughs> to the point where james hetfield doesn't want to talk to you anymore but the the person that you actually kind of uh go off on in the uh the there metallica lars He's still yeah. your best friend. He's one of your best friends to this day. Correct? He's a smart. He's a smart guy. He's sophisticated. You know, his dad was a, a, a professional. Wait, well, probably in the amateur era, but an international tennis player for Denmark. He was in the Davis Cup team. He did Wimbledon, the U.S. Open. You know, Lars had been around the planet half a dozen times before he got to be a teenager, and uh, so he's you know he. he privately educated you know it's a whole different world and um uh he's not gonna he's not gonna fall out with me over some book but james james bless him and i think maybe a little bit to do with his his uh uh sobriety right. it's control for him it's control anything out of his control really really puts him on the back foot and really messes with him and he comes down on it hard. And uh, I haven't spoken to him, but my reading is, is that he's gone, I didn't have anything to do with this book. This guy has betrayed me or, or you know, he's, I, I, you know, I don't know. But it's not true because I went through Peter Mensch, their manager. I sent the guys, Lars and James, all of them, copies of my Led Zeppelin book because I wanted to do it with them. I wanted it to be official. I said, look, this is what I do. Let's do one with you. It'll be amazing. What you've got there, I wanted to do that for Metallica. And they just weren't feeling it. Um, Lars was. I was told Kirk and Lars, yes. James and, um, was it Rob? Yeah, would have been Rob by then. Yeah, Rob didn't really have a say, but James, no. And once James said no, that was it. Um, so they knew about the book. But Lars, I mean, there's a, bit, a fair bit in the book where I suggest he can't actually play the drums, you know, or he couldn't <laughs> in those days. And he rang me not long after the book came out, and he goes, hey, it's your favourite drummer. <laughs> <laughs> so he, yeah, he's just funny and cool. But he used to sleep on my couch in my one-bedroom apartment when he first used to come to London. And i will be trying to get rid of him, you know. And then cut to 1989, the, the American Monsters of Rock tour, Van Halen mining, Scorpions and all this. And Metallica, I think, opened the show or second. Kingdom Come opened, then Metallica. And um, it's all back to the hotel by four in the afternoon. And um, drinking. Drinking has already begun. Um, and he'd be talking to me and he had these... Nasty European habits, Ryan Roxy. Um, <laughs> what, what would those nasty habits be? Well, it was just a different, a different sensibility. He'd go to use the toilet 
and I mean sitting down with his trousers around his ankle, that use. Okay. And he the door wide open so we could still talk. I'm like, yeah, oh, like uh, it's, a, it's a little bit European. It's a, that's a little bit too European. Yeah. <laughs> fact, he, was, he was so sophisticated that he wouldn't shower for like two or three weeks. Well, I, you know what? I, that might just be a rock and roll thing because I try to convince my wife that when you, if you don't shower after a certain amount of time, you certainly get, you get a musk that sets in over you. And then it's kind of, it's good. Ask Lenny Kravitz. I'm sure that Lenny Kravitz is the same way, and he's he's not European. Well, I got to oh, tell my, you, and then my wife goes, "And you're not Lenny Kravitz." So she goes, "Baby, can you close that door, please? I can hear you, everything you guys are saying. Can you need to close the door?" There it is. There you go. That's my life well, right there. May, maybe, but he, you know, he'd be uh, he'd walk into a meeting or something, and you'd see people that you. Oh, <laughs> Well, it wasn't James, Stanley. James would be showering twice a day. You know, James oh. would be, you know, control. Yeah, That's about the control. Him. Maybe, maybe back to that control issue. Did Did you ever uh, Did you ever interview or uh, review the band Life, Sex, Death (LSD)? No, I didn't know. Uh, Stanley, no. there's a there's a there's a a, a nice uh, how you say a uh, an odor that you won't forget. <laughs> For the, you know, <laughs> I I was from the you know because our I I think we're pretty close in age. Maybe I'm 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 a couple years uh, less, but I'm still the same types of bands. And you grew up, and you obviously promoted a lot of the scenes. I came up from the uh, Ricky Rackman world famous Cat House scene. Oh, I was oh, there. Well, on I, I, I used I did go there a few times. Yeah. Yeah. So opening night, I was there with 50 people. I think it was me, Tammy Down, uh, Slash, and, and, and and you know, like 47 others. But I mean, so from that on, from that moment on, it was like uh, that scene was was my scene. So what you're talking, what you're describing earlier in the UK in the late 70s, early 80s, in this amazing scene that you had working with heavy PR and then working you know, then going on with Kerrang, that scene was for me in the LA scene. Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, and it's, it, it, I think the LA scene, um, cause I, I went, I, I, I kept going back and forth and then, and then in the end I just stayed for about three years and I still love it. And I still, well, pandemic before the pandemic, still go back all the time. And, I, and I, for me, the L.A. scene, I don't know if it was because, you know, people got to get in a car and go somewhere or what it is. But I, I found that people really kind of knew each other. You go down the cat house, you'd see guys that you recognize. You didn't always know their names or, or girls. Girls probably did know their names. You know, there were people you saw or people in the business or fringes or just people starting bands or in bands that are already doing well, if you went to, uh, and LA's always been like that, you know, London, because um, I don't know why, because I, I guess it's a city where people walk and they're little streets and you got these funny little basement parts and things. You can have scenes in those days, you could have scenes that were worlds unto themselves. But if you weren't in that world, you didn't really know about it. You know, the, the, the whole new romantic scene with Spandau Ballet and 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 I I had a bit of it with Ultravox was one club in London one club and from that came the whole early eighties you know the scene Duran Duran kind of exploited but belonged to and, and make no mistake those bands the new romantic bands they party just as hard as the heavy metal bands if not more am I correct? No. Absolutely, but the, the club they came out of the Blitz. They had a door policy. It was it was like Studio Fifty Four in New York in the seventies. If you didn't look cool, or the guy just didn't like the look of you, it was Steve Strange. He was the doorman who became who then had a solo career and also with Visage. Um, he was the doorman. The night I turned up because we were going to do Visage and Ultravox, I got turned away and he went, oh, no, 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 he's okay, he's okay. Let the old hippie in, he's okay. You know? <laughs> um, 
Uh, but but it was a huge thing, but only in that club. And you couldn't just come in like the Cat House or, or even the Rainbow, you know, I mean, uh, uh, Roxy, uh, Whiskey. And and, and uh, you go back to like the Starwood and Gazaris and all those places. I don't know. I always just felt, I felt there was a scene. And you'd, you'd talk to someone and say, oh, yeah, later we're going to Roxy or whatever it might be. And you go, oh, I didn't know. Cool, I'll see you there. You know, you it just, to me, it felt uh, more inclusive. We, had our we definitely had our network and stuff of where we're going. We're sitting here with uh, journalists, folks, uh, Mick Wall, um, pretty much the uh, voice of hard rock, heavy metal, uh, and all genres of rock, uh, journalism, and biographies. Uh, this is our In the Trenches live stream episode. If you are listening to us on the audio broadcast, come on into our YouTube official channel. That's Ryan Roxy official right down there that Vic per just put the subscribe button. Hit the subscribe button. And uh, we're going to take a very short break if we can. Um, it's not really something. Maybe I'll, I'll just go full screen. But uh, Mick, I love having you on. I want to talk old school stuff, but I also want to talk about all the stuff that you're up to right now right after i pimp uh our good friends over at uh catfight coffee that's right look at this coffee it's alice cooper branded coffee it just came in uh during the tour so i wanted to give them a quick shout out uh they sent me this really nice cup and i'm all hopped up on coffee nothing like i'm hopped up on like what we're talking with mick wall over here this is not the late 70s but i'm having a good time enjoying my cat fight coffee so you should too that's ac slade big shout out to you and um there you go. That's our commercial for today. That's our big uh, shout out. Of course, we, Buyer Dynamic, we want to give them uh, a lot of credit because I'm able to hear it. Uh, you're having a, is that an espresso or a cappuccino? Yeah, what do you got over there? A double espresso. It's probably my fourth of the day. I, I'm, a, I'm a few hours ahead of you guys, but this is, this is me now. This is my fuel. This is. I love it. Um, do you, do you yeah, ever feel, yeah. do you ever feel, because I, I, uh, you're a journalist, you're an author, you've, you've written so many different bands, bios. Um, do you ever read fiction yourself? And, and when the book I'm going to that kind of influenced me a lot is uh, Clockwork Orange, uh, yeah. Anthony Burgess. And that book, it seems as though the movie ends different than the book. And I've talked about this before in the podcast. It seems to me that whole partying phase for the for the main character in Clockwork Orange in the book, he basically just kind of grows out of it. Have you felt that that you know was that something that happened to you where you, where that whole type of partying, partying, partying lifestyle had you just grew out of, or was it something that happened that you had to stop? Um, or does it uh, ever stop? <laughs> and that's another thing. Oh no, it, no, it, it it definitely stopped and. Yeah, I I, um, I I was interviewing Iggy Pop once, and he was talking to me about something he called the Christ Age, which was uh, when Jesus died. He was 33, and we were making a gag saying it was probably 33 and a third, you know. Like, <laughs> like RPM, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, RPMs. Um, but he was, because I wasn't 33 yet, he, he had already passed it, and he said, it's the Christ Age. He says, that's suddenly where you, you you either make it or you break it. Yeah, it's really, like, you really yeah. do need to... Um, and take it's, stock. You know, what, what, take stock and, and actually admit that you, uh, you could do with a change or, or there's got to be more to life than just this. Or you already know there is and you're getting tired of waiting for it, you know. So um, that happened to me pretty much at exactly that age. And... Uh, I just got back from Los Angeles and grunge was coming in. And I just, uh, I just, um, it seemed like a good moment to not be too excited about it. I, I did, I wrote, I did a Pearl Jam book. I, I wrote about a lot of that scene. Um, but I didn't want to go to the party or the, whatever it was. I didn't know what I wanted. I know what I wanted. I wanted to get out of London. I wanted to go to the countryside. I just had this overwhelming desire to breathe good air and have a big sky. I have bad internet. 
<laughs> well, unfortunately, yes. But I, a month from now, if we, if we ever do this again, it will be perfect. I we will. All right. I, you know what? It's okay. It's fine with your internet. I, I understand there's a natural catastrophe going. A couple snowflakes fell in uh, the UK. So they've we, state of emergency right now. I understand. We, we've got a storm. We've got a storm. I'm just trying to remember what they call it. They give it names, don't they? It's England. So it's probably Storm Agatha or something, you know, uh, um, Storm Elizabeth II. You know, who knows? But it's like 100 miles, every, schools are closed, power cuts, the full catastrophe. Um, the, UK, yeah. the UK is like, I believe the UK is probably the Los Angeles of Europe, because in Los Angeles, when they have a storm and there's like a small light sprinkle, they call it Stormwatch 2022. <laughs> it would be on all the local <laughs> stations, whereas people like in Arkansas are like, yeah, that's Tuesday, friend. And of course, our <laughs> producer Vic is from Arkansas. Yeah, no, listen, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Well, we were saying Sweden, don't don't. Don't talk. How can England or the UK talk to Sweden about snow? Give me a break. You know, the Winter Olympics are on. But God forbid it should snow one day in England. People are falling over, dying. Cars are crashing. Aeroplanes are crashing. It's, it's a disaster. We're just... I, I don't know what it is. We're just no good at anything anymore. Other no, than... your, your fucking rock bands kick ass and they still <laughs> always kick ass. And that's one of the things I want to talk about. The first book that you ever uh, wrote, the first auto, uh, first biography you, you ever contributed to, I believe, was the official biography of Ozzy Osbourne. And yeah. The... Yeah, and, and this is like right around that time uh, after Kerrang, or maybe it's during Kerrang and before Classic during, Rock magazine. During, during, during Kerrang, this is nineteen eighty-five. Okay, eighty-five, eighty-six. So how how did this how did this come about? And did you the minute you wrote it, was it like okay, now I'm on to something? Because that after that, a cavalcade of biographies came in. Yeah, um, uh, I've met Ozzy uh, over the years here and there. He'd been a little bit frightening because both both big times I met him, he was so gone, um, drunk mainly. I mean, not everything, but it was the drink that was really talking, you know. And it hadn't been pleasant. And he was always surrounded by, you know, this entourage of nobodies that just, you know, from his hometown. And it just was horrible. Um, and then in January 1985, at the Rock, first Rock in Rio festival in uh, Brazil. Um, I was there covering it and uh, Ozzy was there and he had a new personal assistant who I happen to know from other times and she said oh you must meet Ozzy I said no no I've met him I've met him I don't need to meet him she said oh no you no, he's fine he's just got out of Betty Ford so anyway I had breakfast with Ozzy and Sharon by the pool and I couldn't eat I was laughing so much I mean I was doubled over laughing and so we sort of did some more, like I said, every week you had to find something to write about. We did more stuff. And then that summer Live Aid, uh, Sharon got Sabbath back together to do Live Aid in Philadelphia. And right. she took me, took me with them for that. And it was round about that time uh, they called and said, look, uh, there had been three previous writers that had done stuff and none of, for whatever reason, they all just got rejected. Um, and they needed someone to come in and finish it quick because the thing was supposed to be coming out. <laughs> Would I do it? And I ended up writing the second half first and the first half second. And yeah. it, it, lots of pictures. It wasn't a, it wasn't as many words as I was right as I would write. Probably about a third or a quarter of what I would do now. But I just basically went through the albums and his career, and uh, I would drink beer, smoke weed and laugh my ass off writing this crazy stuff. It was like a glorified magazine article for Kerrang. But every time they set up a meeting for me to talk to Ozzy for the book, uh, he bailed. You know, he, he was ill, he was drunk. I mean, he, he ended up cooking me a Sunday lunch as, a, as an apology. And he got so... He cooked the whole thing. I was in the kitchen with him, the, the potatoes and the vegetables and the, the beef, you know. And uh, but he was he was opening bottles of wine and pouring them into big jug glasses. And he'd give one to me and I'd be there. It would still be there, you know, the rest of the afternoon. He'd be on to his third bottle. Do you want to top up? No, I've, I've still got about a pint of wine. I'm good. You know, 
So anyway, we sit down to eat, and Sharon's there, the kids, the nanny, and he literally does this cartoon thing. He just literally goes straight for Boom! Face flat. Oh, no. <laughs> Tatoes, gravy. And I'm looking, thinking, because I don't know them that well. I've only known them about six months. I looked at Sharon. I said, uh, uh, is he okay? <laughs> and she goes, then she goes, pass the peas. So now we have to pass the peas over his head. You know, it's like, <laughs> and we finished our lunch. And it's all like, yeah. oh, so uh, I, what, what school do the kids go to? You know, all this kind of stuff. And he's like, ah, ah, you know, blah, uh, not blah, uh, gravy and potatoes. It finally he wakes up. As we're finished and they're clearing the plates away, and he, he sits up and it's all just, it's like Animal House, you know. No. Sharon, Sharon. <laughs> she takes him to bed. She opens a nice bottle of bread, gives me a, a nice glass, and she says, "Look, what do you need to know? Because this can't go on." So I interviewed her, and um, uh, and that's where I got all the information. I mean, I'd interviewed him, so we had his all that yeah. stuff. Here. Well, obviously, no, the face uh, and the gravy plate didn't make the book. And I'm wondering if that's part of, of, of part of this trust that you build up with artists and musicians um, is perhaps not the stuff that you uh, put in the book and release. Maybe sometimes it's the stuff that you don't. The knowledge that you gain, like you must hear even more than what you're sometimes able to put into a book. And then out of respect for the artist, maybe you don't put, put it in the book. Is that no, sort of I, along the lines? Well, if you want to work with them again, for sure. Um, and uh, and also such a thing as respect. You know, we're all professionals. What am I, perfect? You know, I mean, I, I haven't made a million mistakes and bad choices and found myself in situations that I really would not like to see a picture of next week, thank you, or be reminded of six months from now, you know. Um right. But when I'm doing my books, my books, not working with an artist, but just me actually doing a book like Zeppelin, like Metallica, like my Jimi Hendrix book. Um, at that point, I give no consideration to the artist. Um, none. Because I'm not writing the book for them. I'm writing it for this reader in my mind. Like when you're making your music, you're writing music. I imagine that you're writing it for someone that will really get it, you know, uh, as close as you can get it. No one will ever get it exactly like you do, but right. close. That's the magic. That's what I'm trying to do in my books. And, and the only way I can do that is to completely don't take the artist's position as a, as a consideration. Outside, you've always got to be flexible. Outside, maybe a things that it would seem unnecessarily mean to put in. Um, you know, you you need to say what you need to say, but you don't need to actually, like, stab them in the back, you know. So there's a, there's a line, and you kind of learn where that line is as you go along. But, but, but really, it's, it's not top of the list. Top of the list is uh, uh, really just trying to write a book that I can be proud of. It's about a book. It's not about a band, and it's not even about music. It's about literature. When I was um, uh, editor-in-chief at Classic Rock magazine, you know, I took that magazine from, from nothing to on its way to where it is now. Um, everybody would talk to me about some new band and this thing and that thing, uh, but we were a monthly magazine. We weren't a weekly music magazine. We were monthly. The internet right. was coming, and I just felt we couldn't, you know, it, the time of looking for new bands and making it all up, Sounds and Crying would put brand new bands on the cover all the time. We couldn't do that. Um, and I had to kind of explain to the kids that were working for it, listen, guys, you're not in the music business. You're in the magazine business, okay? Mm -hmm. And this magazine is about music, and the way we get the best stories is that you understand that world and are part of that world enough to connect but your business is this magazine and 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 that's kind of how i feel with my books the magazine because we needed it to survive the books no i don't i don't take i mean my hendrix book 
uh, uh, didn't earn me any money. It didn't get a single review over here. The publishers really weren't comfortable with it. Um, but for me, it's the greatest thing I've ever done. I was just going to get into that because I was going to say about your books, they must be like the way for a musician, a songwriter, that each of their songs are their babies in a sense, it's their, their creations. And perhaps maybe what the general public might think is not your best song is your yeah. is your favorite song. It's, it's the one that means most to you. So maybe the one that, you know, perhaps didn't get the most amount of sales is your favorite book. And I, I have heard that you said that two writers were approaching the life mm -hmm. and death of Jimi Hendrix is one of your uh, your own personal favorites. Yeah, because, uh, again, it, to me, it, it must be the same as a musician or or maybe an actor or someone, any, anybody, filmmaker, anybody trying to make art. Um, uh, we're fortunate, I think, these days that there doesn't seem to be an age limit, particularly in this area. You know, back in the 70s or 80s, to... to, to build a whole world around rock stars in their seventies would have seemed silly. It just, but you can do that now because of this, this Mick this, Jagger. This is where we are. <laughs> Alice Cooper. This, this is where we are. The, the rules are gone. Yeah. And um, so, uh, uh, Hendrix to me was like, it felt like, wow, I've made a big breakthrough as a writer. I've gone somewhere I've never gone before. And I was very influenced by James Elroy. Um, mystery writer, I love it. Yeah, yeah and he's, he, you've got to check out his book, American Tabloid. I okay. promise you, one of the greatest books by an American writer ever. And it kind of, and what that does is three. There's a trilogy, but that's start with that one. It's incredible, and it takes the story of the Kennedys and America at that time. And it tells you what I believe to be by far the most plausible thing I've ever read. And, of course, it's incredibly dark and crazy beyond words. And uh, but just brilliant language, fantastic writer. It's like real pure, sexy rock music at its best. But, um, but there is a what if quality to that. And as as well as there's a what if quality in the Jimi Hendrix book, that's a part of the section that we have that is actually inspired from Alice Cooper is never let the truth get in the way of a good story. And you now case in point with this Jimi Hendrix book. Uh, latest book that you wrote the two writers that were approaching the life and death of Jimi hendrix there is a controversial opening and now and it deals with murder right so yeah, perhaps yeah. that's the reason why because it's been a long term um if you will urban legend there's been people whispering about it for years there's been a tour manager here possibly a, a tech you know a road tech there that have come forth, but not come forth all the way. And what is it that made that intro of your Jimi Hendrix book so controversial? Well, uh, first of all, you've got to start. It's like at the opening track on side one. You've got to start with a big number. Um, <laughs> if you look at all my books, they all have that first line is like meant to be the bullet in the head. Um, uh, and then you go back to tell how it got there. Uh, but uh, uh, Page one deals with the murder of Jimi Hendrix. Um, but it begins with the words, said the Joker to the thief. And um, the two things, so apart from wanting a wonderful uh, opening to a book, um, my Doors book begins with the real death of Jim Morrison, which, of course, wasn't in a bathtub. It was actually in the ladies' toilets of a French nightclub. Um uh, uh, and that is the truth. Um, Hendrix. So how have we all been Mandela effect? How have we all suffered from well, the Mandela well, effect of him of him being in a bathtub filled with water? Is it because of the movie? I guess it's just because of you know what, what, what. These things get repeated and repeated and repeated. So same with Hendrix. You know, I bought every book that ever came out on Hendrix, even the terrible ones, and. They all tell the same story. Some tell it better than others. And it just is bullshit. You know, it, you know, Hendrix in Carnaby Street. I mean, 
he was in London less than nine months. He couldn't wait to get back to America. And he was a black man surrounded by white people in London. Noel Redding, Noel Redding told me, it, like in all sincerity, he said, oh, no, Jimmy, asking about, you know, Jimmy being black. He said, oh, well, no, you see, it wasn't like that with Jimmy. Jimmy was an honorary white man. You know, Hendrix came from a really hard, difficult past. He had to accommodate a lot of gangsters and people, uh, especially after he got famous. And um, But they all tell the same story. Jim died in the bathtub. Jimmy died from an accidental overdose of sleeping tablets. Really. This guy that would drop five mandrakes, six quaaludes, Three tabs of acid. He had a pretty high over- tolerance. There's no doubt that that's not he, urban legend. That is fact. Yeah, he overdosed on sleep. Come on, I mean, uh, uh, and on top of this, and this is what always gets me. If you, most people when they write that book, they come to that bit and they just they're just trying to figure out how they can put it in their great way that he accidental overdose. They're not thinking. They're not thinking. Go and have a look. Don't don't decide. Just uh, and do you know what? There is so much material out there. So much evidence. Police reports, doctors' reports, uh, things that Eric Burden has now admitted being round there that night and clearing the joint out. Jimmy was there for quite a while before anybody called an ambulance. And Monica was told to go take a hike while the boys took care of things. Yeah. Hendrix. Uh, his his the report into his death, the actual medical report. He died of what they estimate could be up to five bottles worth of wine in his lungs, not in his stomach. It didn't get there because he drank it. He got there because they waterboarded him with wine. He didn't even drink a lot of wine. So, um, so, 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 so but here's here's the real point. Here's the real point. Okay. There's all that uh, and all the discrepancies, lots of people that know more and have said more in the years since. But I also wanted to make it a comment on how awful the other Hendrix stories are, how I feel hateful the orthodoxy around Hendrix is. It's almost it's almost too racist for words. You know, this poor boy comes from America and is native from the jungle comes to civilized land and wows the pretty people and they take him as an honorary member of their own tribe. Oh, isn't that great? You know, Hendrix had to do what he had to do. He'd pimped in New York. He'd signed any contract, anybody stuck under his nose for 50 bucks. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Cause you're in Harlem and you're a black guy in 1964. What are you going to do? You know, that story to me had never been told. So I just wanted it to be like, listen, you guys have spent decades and 50 books and documentaries saying he died of an accidental overdose of sleeping tablets. Um, that's, that's less plausible than what I'm going to lay on you right now. So what I'm laying on you right now is coming from Elroy in the sense that I am absolutely not claiming that's what happened. Uh, it, precisely, but I am telling you in my more it's, novelistic form that this is actually way more plausible than any other story you've ever heard about Hendrix's death. So, in your opinion, in your opinion, Hendrix was murdered, fact or fiction? Fact. You'd lean, you'd lean more towards fact. Okay. Well, 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 that's the thing. I mean, you know, I can't. I wasn't there. We weren't there. So I can't say categorically fact. We'll never uh, will. We will never will know, will we? Yeah. It, it's like that Bill Maher thing. You know, I, I can't prove it. I just know it. You know, uh, uh, to, it's just to me, that's more plausible. You know, these things like in my Zeppelin book, you know, you get to that part where Bonham dies. And that's why Led Zeppelin split up. And, and even through the years, I spent 20 years interviewing Jimmy Page and hanging out with him. And, and even he would say to me about, you see, Bonzo, there were four elements in Zeppelin, and Bonzo was one of them. 
and once that element was gone, it was irreplaceable. And I'll be lapping all this up, and you see it in every article and book. Bull. It's bull. <laughs> so, okay? so, so basically, bull. okay, so uh, I just missed back, Vic Shell fought with his fact and fiction, because you actually have a fact that the that, that Jimi Hendrix, you know, if it's more plausible that he was murdered. That could be a fact. But now we're saying Led Zeppelin breaking up and staying broken up because of Bonzo's death. Yeah. Fiction. Yeah, That's of course. Fiction. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh. Absolutely. <laughs> let, me, let me prove it to you. Let me right. prove it to you. I'm going to ask I'm you a question. I'm going to ask you a question. And, and everybody listening. Cut to 10 years earlier. Led Zeppelin 2 has just come out number one in America, number one in Britain. In 1970, Led Zeppelin will be voted a more popular band than the Beatles, and they will do a big interview in New York talking about it for television and Rolling Stone and whatever. Now, imagine if John Bonham had died right then. Maybe he had a heart attack. Maybe he uh, had a car crash. Some, uh, it doesn't matter. John Bonham is suddenly dead. Do you think they would not have been able to carry on without that fourth element? Yeah, I mean, there's 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 two bands that I come to think of where they, they went both ways. ACDC, Bon Scott passes away, probably at the height of their their, their career. They well, released. Well, they, they, were, they were just coming to that Highway to Hell. I like would hell. And they'd America. already they'd already wrote a lot of the songs for Back in Black. Absolutely, so, but that, that was going to be the one that they knew yeah. would put them over. Well, um, th that was they the carried on. They carried on. But the other band I'm thinking of, and we've already talked about them, is Hanoi Rocks. And I've talked to Michael before many times. When Razzle died, yeah, that was the end of the band in many ways. So I see, I don't know. Well, 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 now listen, I, that, that could, that's right. You're absolutely right. But, uh, that's Hanoi rocks, you know, um, God bless them. They, they didn't come near the success Zeppelin had. Yeah, you know, that's true. Know, but, but they were right on that. Popular band since the Beatles, their album is number one in America. I mean, that just didn't happen to British artists very often. And uh, there is no way Jimmy Page, an intensely ambitious 26-year-old, who's just turned a cranky old band called the Yard... Well, the Yardbirds were cool, but on the way out, tried to launch as the new Yardbirds. How lame is that? <laughs> um, spinal tap. It's yeah. A bit spinal tap. Uh, uh, Plant was like third or fourth choice of singer behind Steve Marriott, Terry Reid, someone else I can't remember. Um, uh, uh, Bonham was like fifth or sixth choice drummer. Uh, Jonesy just was Jimmy's session mate. No one special at all in terms of launching a star's career. And um, Jimmy took that through that first album, which was all Jimmy all the time, but with these amazing singers and drummers, singer and drummer. And then number two, Whole Lot of Love, Bring It On Home, Dude, we are into we are we are we've left the earth now and we've passed the moon and we're going to Mars. Do you honestly think if Bonham had died at that moment, Jimmy Page wouldn't have just got someone else in? I guarantee mm. you, I guarantee you. There's no way. There's no way. So you saying that so why that why they when Bonham died, why that didn't work out was because the band was already dead. Right, right. You know, that, that final album, Page was a ghost. He was so deep into his heroin. Uh, it's not, you can't even say addiction, heroin life. Um, you know, he, it just, they were gone. Plant hated being around. This was the final straw. This is my this is my last fact or fiction question I will ask you about this because I have heard you uh, talk about this before and I, don't, I never got a definitive answer. Is it true that when you were working on or decided to or talking about working on a Led Zeppelin type of biography that Jimmy wanted you to actually disparage Robert <laughs> Plant 
<laughs> with a certain word that we were talking about before we actually started the podcast, an yeah. English word that starts with a C can be a compliment sometimes, but mostly is not a compliment. Mostly now, not a compliment. <laughs> now, did, did Jimmy <laughs> want you to use that in the book or is that a fact or fiction? Well, it's a fact, but um, fact, you, folks. you have to put it's a fact, <laughs> um, but you've got to put it into context. You know, okay. this, this wasn't we're in a meeting and we're discussing terms. This was Jimmy, you know, uh, uh, he, 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 like when you drunk dial, you know, he wasn't drunk. I didn't get that sense at all. Um, but what I'm saying is, is he was pissed off. And, and what I discovered later was what I was told. So I can't, I wasn't there, but this is what I was told. There had been the three guys in Zeppelin get together every so often just for a business meeting. Stuff comes up, proposals, what do we think of this? You know, And um, a proposal had come up for a theme park in America, Led Zeppelin theme park. And like, like Dolly World or but this, God knows what this would be, you know. What kind of um, rides would you have on a Led Zeppelin? <laughs> would you have <laughs> would you, the shark? You'd have the shark, obviously, yeah. the shark <laughs> ride, which no one would want to go on. <laughs> or being hosed down, yeah. <laughs> You've got the in through the outdoor ride where God knows what's going on. Um, and then there's My Stairway God. to Heaven. Yeah. That Stairway um, to Heaven might be nice. That'd be a good roller coaster, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Until <laughs> right back to hell. Um, and uh, Jimmy was all for it, and Robert wasn't. Robert thought the whole thing was tacky. Uh, hey, you know, uh, but it would have earned an incredible amount of money, and it would have just been what they call letterbox money. You know, it's not depending on if you know, is your next song going to be a hit, is the tour going to sell out? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's it's Dolly World for Zeppelin. It's just going to make money just, while you sleep. It's just, exactly that's it. <laughs> um, and Robert wasn't for it, so that was the end of that. And, you know, Jimmy and Robert have a really, uh, you know, fractious relationship. And um, so he was really pissed off. And uh, I, he knew all about the book. That's a long story. But originally I wanted him to do his own book. I wanted him to make it like Dylan's Chronicles. So you don't have to mention anything you don't want to mention. But just get your voice talking about the other Music. Days. Maybe exactly. music, maybe exactly. not groupies, maybe not drugs. For no, absolutely. maybe not because <laughs> I think well, because I think we're kind of past that now. With we've seen the documentaries, we're on the internet. Yeah, you know, it's not news in the seventies. The biggest rock bands in the world took drugs and had groupies. Who knew? You know. Um, <laughs> uh, so what else can you tell me? And and of course, a lot. Um, anyway, he. he Played with it, then decided not. So the publisher said to me, well, look, we, got, we want to do a Zeppelin book anyway. There is no big, important Zeppelin book. There's only Hammer of the Gods. That's the only one anybody, that's the only one everybody knows. It came out in the 80s. Why don't we just do something that blows it out of the water and make it amazing? And if I'd said no, they'd have just got another writer to do it. So he knew all that. But anyway, anyway. I, tr I tried to keep it friendly and said, so look, you know, but if there is anything you want to, something you want to get off your chest in the book, <laughs> about 10 o'clock on a Saturday night, I'm home watching the football. Um, I, my kids are all really little at the time. They're in bed, thank God. You know, I'm watching the football at 10 on a Saturday night. You know what I mean? Phone rings. Jimmy. Hi, Jimmy. You know. <laughs> Here we go. Yeah, yeah. You, you, and, he, and when he gets pissed off, he sort of talks like this, you know. He's quite well, very well spoken, but when he gets pissed off, you know, he's, he goes, uh, he goes, are you still doing that book? I said, no, you know I am. I said, in fact, I was, I interviewed Donovan the other day. He went, what does he know? I went, oh, okay. <laughs> you talk about and, Donovan, the Donovan, the singer of Back yeah, to Billion yeah. Dollar Babies, the spoken word of Billion Dollar Babies. Absolutely, yes, <laughs> absolutely. So uh, Paige had played on loads of Donovan records as a session man, and Donovan was in that late So I can tell he's not in the right mood. Right. And uh, he goes, uh, I, I just there's just one thing I want you to say. <laughs> I went, All oh, right, what, what's that? 
I'm sensing it's not good news. And also, right. to be honest, I'm trying to watch the game, you know. And uh, he goes, uh, I just want to make sure you say Robert Plant is a... Yeah, see you next Tuesday. There you go. <laughs> I went, I was like, I said, I can't say that, Jimmy. Um, I said, but you can. I would absolutely have you in there saying that, of course. No, 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 that's not what I mean. That's not, I want you to say it. <laughs> I, said, I can't, I can't do it. I, I, I can't, unless I feel it, unless it's something I felt I needed to say. Right. And I can't imagine the context that would come up. Um, I said, no, I just can't do it. I'm so sorry. Well, ugh, ugh, you know. So, I would uh, never go on the hot air balloon ride at the Led Zeppelin theme park, just so you know. I mean, that, <laughs> <laughs> that would end badly, I think, you know? Well, the when, when, the le the when the levee breaks. Oh, ride. man, that would be definitely the, wa the log ride. That would totally be the, the water park ride. I love it. Or, <laughs> well, <laughs> listen, th so that ends up being a fact. Jimmy did say that. We've got that down. We are done with that section of the of the show. I can't thank you enough, uh, Mick, for being a part of this. I mean, I know we're going a little over time for you. Are you cool with hanging out a couple more minutes? I, I, or I, gotta, I, gotta, I have literally got to go in a couple of minutes, only because it's – uh, Friday night here it was my youngest daughter's 19th birthday uh -huh. on Wednesday. We'll Wish her, her a tonight. very happy birthday. I, I, I mean, so we do have just, um, we have a section called let the people speak. We don't even have to do the animation for it, Vic. We just, I just want people to know. I want Mick to know that I just met up with Guy Griff from the choir boys, London choir oh, boys. Right. And he, he wanted me to tell you, because this is a part of our section where we have uh, uh, fans and followers that have asked you questions, um, yeah. talk oh. about things. And he wanted you to know that he is reading your ACDC book for the second time. So wow. that so he's very impressed with it. And perhaps maybe a, a choir boys uh, biography is in the works at some point down the line. Um, I, also, you know, it's, it's, it's funny. I, I was talking to Spike, the singer, about three yep. years ago about there has to be something, you, you know, maybe we could do one day something. Cause it's a, it's a great story. You know, it'd be like yeah. one of those great sort of single story rock books, like uh, that book on the very, on, on the Sex Pistols American tour. There's one book about all of that. It's fantastic. I think it's called 12 Days on the Road or something. Amazing. First um, American tour I did with London Choir Boys was my band. We opened up for them on their first Amer North American tours. That was oh, Electric really? Eight. Electric uh -huh. Angels opened up for London Choir Boys. So that was my band back in the day. Wow. With lots of hair. Yeah. Lots yeah, of yeah. hair. Yeah, me too. <laughs> me too. Wow. And Matt, that was a good band, yeah. Matt Bishop, uh, another one of our faithful uh, In the Trenches listeners, uh, wanted to talk a little bit about, he wants to know your involvement in the Ronnie James Dio documentary that comes out in September. Yeah. Um, well, this followed on from, uh, I ghosted... That's on. That no pun intended. It's in 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 the, in the business. It's called ghostwriting. I uh, worked on Ronnie's memoir, uh, which came his official memoir in Ronnie's words, which came out last summer. Uh, it's called Rainbow in the Dark. It came out in America. It did very well uh, on the New York Times uh, bestseller list. It did well over here in the UK, and it's now in various translations around the world. And that was um, Ronnie had begun writing his own autobiography by hand. He never used a typewriter or a computer. And long, long, long story short, um, uh, he didn't complete it, but he did have various notes about what he, what he, what, where he wanted to go. And the thing is, I knew Ronnie for thirty years. Uh, heavy publicity. We did Black Sabbath when Ronnie joined uh, in the eighties. I wrote about him, had him on my TV show. Uh, I was back doing his publicity in the mid-90s when his career was really in crisis. And me and Wendy and Ronnie just would always have dinner if, if one was in town or whatever. You know, I got to know the man really well. Um, and he went from terrifying me when I worked for him uh, in, in 1980 to being the most gracious, charming, uh, really, really wonderful guy. Um, and uh, so I did that. We took his words. 
Then we took everything from this massive archive Wendy's got and my own personal archive of uh, having interviewed him and spoken to him so much over those years, and we finished off the book. Um, and then while that was happening, uh, a doc this documentary was being made to sort of, not so much tie in with the book, but to sort of com complement it. You know, it's yeah, Ronnie's no. story. So they came around, um, uh, God, I don't know, man. I think we were in our third lockdown here in the UK. Right. And um, they came to my house. <clears throat> I didn't have a problem with that. Um, we were We were about four months into the third lockdown things are starting to and we live on a farm you know we plenty of ventilation so we did it here and i was quite surprised i've done a lot of these but this was intense um went on for about four hours um with breaks and uh and i realized these guys actually oh it these guys know what they're doing it's actually going to be it sounds like it's going to be a really good documentary so uh, I haven't seen it yet. I'm looking forward to it. Um, I hear good things, but you, you do, don't you? We'll have to wait and see. But uh, I have a feeling that this could be very good, yeah. Well, there's so much more to talk about, but we are going to let you go and have your Friday night with your kids. And uh, again, happy birthday to your daughter coming Thank up. You. And uh, I just really appreciate you being in the trenches with us for as long as you have. Um, perhaps next time you come on, we can talk uh, more about these stories, but obviously more about what you're doing currently with all the podcasts and the Get Your Rocks Off podcast. Yeah. And here's all the uh contact information if anybody is uh listening to us i will just say real quick at mick dot wall seven mick wall on facebook mick wall um pinterest and of course the get your rocks up podcast are those the best ways to get in touch with you mick wall yeah uh you <clears throat> you can also uh if you if you're on apple or spotify or uh, whatever streaming platform you're on for pods you can just look for the Mick Wall podcast because that's uh, uh, one I started. We did about 36 eps of Get Your Rocks Off. Still out there, still on the, all the platforms. But then I was actually on tour for about seven weeks. And when I got back, um, I've now got a Patreon page. Of course, that's at Mick Wall on Patreon. Perfect. There you go. So, we, so I, I've restructured things. We still do... Um, I still do the Mick Wall podcast. I do it with John Hotton as I did with Get Your Rocks Off. But I also now do episodes of Dead Rock Stars on that site. Um, and Which we weren't able to talk about enough. Now, can I can I next get a time, uh, next time? Can I get you a sort of verbal commitment? <laughs> or we'll, we'll we'll do a part two next time. There you go. Your studio looks oh, like my, my studio. God, I can't <laughs> believe you showed that photograph. That's Big Sal Fon. He'll show anything. <laughs> <laughs> and there's your and dog. Gets, it, oh, that's that's Coco the Metal Pug. He he features on all the Get Your Rocks Off pods, and he does show up on the Mick Wall podcast. You know he's there because you hear the really loud snoring. Um, he's a pug. And he scratches and cries at the door if we don't let him in. And he comes in and passes out and snores on my feet. So <laughs> you know. he our, loves producer, music. <laughs> our producer has Stanley, which is the dog for that. And But today, and of course, we have our cats, but this is Cat Fight Coffee, this episode being sponsored by. And shout out to them again in Buyer Dynamic. Uh, Mick Wall, it's been a pleasure. I can't wait to talk more uh, stories, rock and roll, old school, new school, and what's coming anytime, up. Because Anytime. Been a real, real pleasure. Thank and you. Enjoy your weekend and everybody else. I know we didn't have time for fan of the week this week, but it's coming next week. We have a special fan of the week, a special announcement as plus as our guest, we will announce our get our next guest uh, coming up over the weekend. So folks, you've been listening to myself, Brian Roxy in the trenches with our special guest, Mick wall until next time. Enjoy the ride. See ya. <laughs>